So now we're here with another brief choral interlude. Notice that Sophocles' choral odes tend to be quite a bit shorter than those of Aeschylus. Um, very pointed, but also short. Um, the, one of the main reasons for this choral ode right here is that one of the three actors has to go change costumes right now. Um, all three actors were occupied in the previous scene. One was playing Creon, one is Mene, one Antigone. But now one of the two females has to change and get into the Hymon mask and outfit. So that's why you needed a choral ode right here. Um, and so, you know, the chorus once again gives, you know, just kind of a, an extended meditation. Um, Lucky are those whose lives know no taste of sorrow, all right? But for those whose houses has been shaken by God, there is never a cessation of ruin. So the idea basically um, that we've seen before of the familial curse, okay? Um, and the curse that has been on this house of Thebes, all right? And now we move from there um, to a agon that takes place between Creon and Hymon. Okay, so we're going to say here basically at 676, um, the two men, father and son, enter. Um, and the chorus asks the question, does he come grieving for the fate of his bride-to-be, knowing that he's going to be cheated of his marriage? Okay, all right. So, um, Creon asks his son, why have you come here? Um, you must have heard what I've said. Are you furious with me? Um, do I still have your love? Hymon responds, I'm yours, Father. Um, your excellent judgment, you lay right before me. I follow it, okay? And no marriage will ever be valued by me as to override the goodness of your leadership. So notice, Hymon starts out in a subordinate position here, um, saying that, Look, I'm going to accept you, Father. My, my, my father comes first before my intended marriage. Um, Creon accepts that. All right? Um, this should always be in your heart. Everything else shall be second to your father's decision. Okay? Look at that firm statement of the patriarchy and the patriarchal order. All right? Um, so, uh, so the proper role of the son is to be obedient. All right? And Creon considers here that if a man have sons that are no use to him, what can one say of him but that he has bred so many sorrows to himself and laughter to his enemies? All right. Um, okay. And then he says to him, look, you know, don't, uh, don't think about the pleasure of a woman because if it's an evil woman that you share your bed with, then that embrace will grow cold. Um, and there's no greater wound than a false friend, so throw her out um, like an enemy and let her marry someone in death's house. Okay, so she's going to marry someone among the dead. Uh, and he says, this is why I'm doing it. I caught her in disobedience, and I'm not going to make myself a liar. So notice there's an element of pride in this, right? We've seen it before. Creon said it several times, like, I'm not the man, and she's the man if I let her get away with this. Um, and now he's saying, look, I'm not going to let the city look upon me as a liar. I made a proclamation. I need to be good to my word. All right. Um, so that's Creon's statement here. Um, he continues by saying that when a city has set up a man to rule, that man must be obeyed in things, in small things and in just, but also in their opposites. Okay. So. Um, that is uh, his basic statement. And finally, he closes with yet another gender role invocation, right? Um, we cannot give victory to, woman, to a woman. If we accept defeat, let it be from a man. We must not let people say that a woman beat us. All right? So we're seeing very explicitly uh, the theme about gender roles and recurring questions um, about those roles and the, the threat they pose to the patriarchy, okay? All right, now Hymon gets his turn to respond to his father's argument, all right? Um, 
and he starts by saying, look, the of the things that men have, our natural sense is the best thing we have, okay? And so he says, look, I wouldn't declare you wrong. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. But he does say, there might be something useful that some other than you might think, right? So it might be worth listening to another human being on this. And he says to him that the popular will is moving towards Antigone. Um, he tells his father, look, your face, Creon, scares simple citizens. It frightens them. And they don't tell you what you don't want to hear. But I hear these things. I hear that the city mourns for this girl. They think she's dying wrongly and most is undeservedly for glorious acts. So notice, Antigone has said she thinks the gods are on her side. And now Hymon's saying that the people are on Antigone's side, okay? Um, so, that, uh, that the people are now sharing great sympathy for someone who saw to it that her brother would be buried, all right? Um, again, he acknowledges his subordination to his father. I own... Nothing I own I value more highly, Father, than your success. So once again, very stating very clearly, look, Dad, this is all about you, okay? But he says, do not bear this single habit of mind to think what you say and nothing else is true. Basically, acknowledge that you might be wrong. A man who thinks that he alone is right or what he says or that or what he is himself unique, such men, when opened up, are seen to be quite empty, right? So he's saying that, there's an emptiness to the tyrant. And then finally, he closes and says here, um, a man, though he be wise, it is no shame to learn. Learn many things and not maintain his views too rigidly. Notice again, we're getting this invocation of the idea of rigidity versus flexibility, um, principles versus compromise. And uh, Hyman gives us another metaphor that should remind you of the, the iron, the toughest iron metaphor. Look at what he says here. He says, you notice how by streams in wintertime, the trees that pr yield preserve their branches safely, but those that fight the tempest perish utterly. So the idea there is then that, um, that when storms come, the trees that make it are the ones who bend. Um, and the trees that, that uh, get crushed and killed are the ones that don't bend, so instead they break and snap. Um, a second metaphor that makes this exact same point is the, the sailing metaphor. The man who keeps the sheet of his sail tight and never slackens capsizes his boat and makes the rest of his trip keel uppermost. So the idea there is that when you hold your sail tight and not allow it to slacken based on wind conditions, that that's how you capsize your boat. And then you make the rest of your trip with your boat upside down. That's what it means to have your keel uppermost. So both those metaphors and the toughest iron metaphor all point in the same direction, that yielding is better than remaining firm. Um, yield something of your anger, Father. Give way a little. Okay. Notice what Creon says to him, or excuse me, the chorus says to him, they say, hey, he's got a point. Creon, you should learn from him. Um, both of you have spoken well. There's things you could learn from each other. Um, but as we've seen in this play, Antigone and Creon have failed to compromise, and we're going to see that with father and son. Okay. Um, and so now the argument, notice, we went from those long speeches uh, Creon, then Hymon, and now we're going into Stichomythia. So now we're going to the back and forth. And this point gets heated between father and son. Um, they argue about, uh, Creon says, you are respecting rebels. Um, and he, uh, he says that um, Antigone is tainted by this wickedness, wickedness. Hymon says, look, all the people of Thebes reject that point, father. Uh, Creon responds that, should I let them tell me how to rule then? Um, should I let someone else's judgment rule the land? 
Paimon tries to point out the difference between tyranny and democracy. There is no city possessed by one man only. Okay? Um, is not the city thought to be the rulers? And Haimon responds, you would be a fine dictator of a desert. So look at what he's saying there to his father. He's saying you'd be a great ruler if there were no people in your city. Man, that's harsh. Okay. Um, and then finally they get to the point now where Haimon is no longer playing along with his father or yielding. He tells him outright, I see your acts as mistaken and unjust. All right. And, and Creon responds, your nature is vile and yielding to a woman. Um, father and son have said just awful things to each other here, and uh, they're not about to stop at this point. Okay? Um, so, Creon says, finally, you will never marry her while her life lasts. Um, and then Hymon responds, then she must die and die, dis dying destroy another, which seems to foreshadow that somehow Antigone's death is going to destroy Hymon as well. Okay? Now, Creon doesn't understand that, as is always the case. Um, the, uh, the tragic hero doesn't really see what's coming. Um, so he takes that as a threat to himself, when really, as we're going to see, it's, it's Hymon threatening himself, Hymon, not Creon. All right? Um, all right. And so um, the uh, Creon is done with this argument. He tells the servants to bring out Antigone um, and that she's going to die um, right next to her would-be husband. So look at how harsh Creon's being here. Um, not only is he going to take his son's future bride, but he's, gonna say, he's saying here, you're going to watch her go, right? She's going to die before his very eyes right now. Um, I mean, Creon has absolutely gone to the extreme of, uh, of um, his position, okay? And then Hymon says, she's not going to die my, by my side. Um, I'm not going to stay here and let you do that. Um, but you will never again set eyes upon my face. Look at that threat. Um, and we're going to see how that threat bears out. Now... Based on the chorus's words, we see that Hymon is leaving, so we're going to write in here, exit Hymon. And so now it's just the chorus and Creon, okay? Um, and the, uh, the servants are out to get Antigone right now to go bring her in. And so that ends the agon between father and son.